Hey, what's up you guys and welcome back to MVR. Today we're gonna have a first look at the new developer commentary mode in Half-Life Alex. Let me know in the comments down below if you want to see more of this going forward. And without further ado, let's jump in. My name is Gabe Newell, and welcome to Half-Life Alex. To say this product was a challenge would be an understatement. It's our first Half-Life title in over 10 years, and it's our first one in virtual reality. In addition to it being a great VR experience that still felt like a Half-Life game, we wanted Half-Life Alex to serve players who've been waiting to find out what happens after Episode 2, and at the same time, provide an on-ramp to anyone who hasn't played a Half-Life game at all. Ultimately, whether we succeeded in any of that is up to you to decide, but hopefully this commentary mode will give you some insight into the set of problems we faced and how we chose to tackle them. To listen to a commentary node, pick up the floating hologram of a radio headset in front of you and simply put it on your head. Once you're done listening to the commentary, you can take the radio headset off or simply put on the next one. Please let me know what you think. I can be reached at gayben at valvesoftware.com. While I'm unable to reply to all the emails I receive, I do read them all, and they're a critical part of the feedback we use to evaluate our work. Thanks, and have fun. So, we can put on headsets like that one and take them off. I'm just not sure. I could take that one off. Man, I always forget just how impressive this world is. I mean, look at this vista. Look at those people. But I guess you guys are here for the commentary, so let's get to it. As in the case of any Half-Life game, the first hour of Alex must convey a lot of information to the player, hopefully in a natural and entertaining way. Players need to know who they are, where they are, what kind of world they're in, who the other important characters and factions are, and so on. At the same time, they need to learn how to actually play the game. How do they move? What can they interact with and how? What should they be trying to do? Etc. Figuring out exactly what information we would try to convey in these first two levels, and how it would be conveyed, took us over two years of playtesting. It's tempting to try and include everything we think a player should know, but all information has a priority and the more we include, the more chance there is that a player misses something important because they're distracted or confused by something less important. So over the next two levels, we'll use commentary nodes to point out some of the specific places where we grappled with conveying information to the player. In between these nodes, you'll likely be able to spot many other examples for players to find, if they're interested in paying closer attention and understanding more. One of the pieces of important information we struggled to convey was exactly when Half-Life Alex is set within the series timeline. Whilst we tried to reflect it carefully in many of the world details, it was never 100% successful during playtests. Eventually, we decided it was too important to be left to the players to figure out, and so we put it in our opening text crawl. The Citadel's incomplete state did provide us with an early opportunity to reinforce the timeline visually. Half-Life Alex takes place five years before the events of Half-Life 2, in which the towering citadel represents the Combine seat of power. As we see here, however, early Combine infrastructure is a cluttered mess of cables and unusual structures sprawled all over the city, surrounding the citadel's construction, and served as a useful indicator of the time frame. We went on to reinforce this impression in other places throughout the following level. Combine architecture tends to be abstract in scale and form, so we included some familiar visual cliches of human construction, 
the large external scaffolds, some distinction of floor levels, rows of small lights, and the tidying of the silhouette into more structured vertical elements, try and strike a balance between capturing the alien nature of the citadel whilst grounding its construction in enough familiarity to better understand its size and state. Large sweeping vistas such as this one proved an interesting challenge in virtual reality. Their distance from the viewer means they don't benefit from stereoscopic vision the way that small close-up objects do. Because of this, the small objects on the balcony often draw the attention of the players before they've even noticed the imposing structure in the distance. If we moved the citadel too close, it felt absurdly huge and difficult to take in. Yet placed alone on the horizon, it felt two-dimensional and flat. We found the solution in filling the space between the viewer and the distance structure with many scale references. The city itself, huge supply cables leading towards the vanishing point, large repeated combine buildings, heavy pollution fog, careful lighting, and all the animated elements, especially the helicopter whose sound begins in the fade-in. All these were carefully composed to help draw the attention of the player to the citadel first, before letting their attention wander to take in the details of the city and settle, ultimately, on the inviting items here on the balcony. Man. This is definitely one of the most impressive visual vistas you get to see in this game, like, right out of the gate. Let's see the old ones respawn, eh? In these first areas of the game, we grappled a lot with the density and prioritization of the information we were conveying to the player. Playtesting showed us that players in VR were easily distracted, often due to better peripheral vision, such that they'd focus on one scene element while losing track of others. This was exacerbated in these first rooms because players were acclimatizing to being in VR, often for the first time. In addition, different players progress at different speeds. We saw some players spend 30 seconds on the opening balcony and others 30 minutes. As a result, we did a lot of iteration over the set of opening areas, each time changing what information we tried to convey and where. Initially, the video call from Eli took place in the later refuge room with the snark and camcorder, but players were often too engrossed in interacting with all of the detail in that room to pay attention to the conversation between Eli and Russell. We moved the video call out to the starting balcony, but there it distracted from the establishing shot of City 17 and the Citadel. It also came at a time when players were still figuring out core game elements like movement and hand interaction with the world. That collision made simple things hard, like when to show the player a movement tooltip if they immediately started the video call. Eventually, we settled on inserting the greenhouse between the starting balcony and the refuge, which allowed us to move the call to an area with a slightly obscured vista and fewer interactable objects. This avoided the distraction problems and ensured players were past the initial gameplay moments of figuring out their hardware and movement setup. It also had the bonus of allowing us to add further detail to the opening balcony and Alex's refuge without fear of creating distractions from the video call. Alex! How's it looking up there? It's good, Dad. Metrocop movement is normal. Same for the combine patrols. How's it going in the stockyard? <laughs> One combine mini reactor from a shipment of 4,000. They're never going to miss it. Here, see for yourself. Mm hmm. And not only that, someone's hacked into the combine construction network. Don't get greedy, guys. We're not made of time here. One minute and I'm out. Guaranteed. Mm hmm. Oh, also, I spotted the combine moving supplies into the quarantine zone. That place has been deserted for years. Hmm. That is all. Well. What well, we'll look into it when we get back. What is it? Meet back at the safe house, baby. We'll be there soon. It looks like... What is it, Russell? Would you... Terrific. There you go. Man. This game never ceases to amaze me with its insane level of detail. I mean, if I didn't know any better, this, this hallway just could have been anywhere, like real. Some Eastern European town.
gets me every time. Beyond conveying critical information about the state of the world, the first two levels of Half-Life Alex also needed to demonstrate some of VR's strengths. Conveying a sense of scale is something VR does much better than flat screens, and our early playtests showed us that nothing quite sold that scale more than seeing a strider up close. In addition to the visuals, to fully illustrate the scale of a strider at close range, we needed to do a lot of work on its audio treatment. Players had strong expectations about feeling the weight, power and presence of the strider through its movements, particularly as it stepped on the balcony the player was occupying. In order to convey this power through sound, we layered multiple sound effects, allowing us to address ranges in the audio frequency spectrum and the temporal nature of those elements separately. We then combined those elements in the Source 2 audio engine to control them as one sound. Just goes to show like how much detail was put into this first scene where you get the strider and they just over-engineered this, this tiny piece to make this entire VR experience worth it, like immersive, to sell it to the player. That is the kind of level of detail that you wait 10 years for to experience. Because I don't think any other company other than Valve actually invests that much time into these world building immersive details. It's crazy, really crazy. This room, internally referred to as Alex's Refuge, was initially the location where the Eli video call took place. However, once that video call was moved out to the balcony, this room was freed up to solve other problems. In the Half-Life series, we've always tried to ensure that there's generally enough narrative for all players to understand where they're going and why, but for players who slow down and pay attention, there's more detail that can lead to a greater understanding. With the balcony being a place to get familiar with the game's inputs, the greenhouse being where the story kicks off, and the strider there to surprise players with spectacle, we decided that the refuge could be a quiet moment for players, where they could discover more narrative detail in the environment. At the same time, it could be a place where they can play around a bit more now that they're acclimated to being in VR. Spending time in the refuge is meant to bring players into Alex's role in the resistance and her place in the world. We wanted it to feel like a real stakeout spot where Alex had been cooped up for weeks or months while planning the heist doing research on the Combine. The camcorder, snark, and whiteboards are all toys that respond to detailed interaction and reward deeper investigation, giving curious players more information about the world of City 17 and what Alex has been doing in it. This thing is so cute. And I had never noticed this sketch of dog before. It's amazing. Really is a pity that this never made it into the game. All right, I guess we move on. And ground floor, please. Yep. Power outages. Alex, are we good? Yep, they got the reactor. Easy peasy. I'm headed back to the safe house right now to meet Dad. Go. We'll be in touch. Stay safe. Two critical pieces of information that we needed players to understand were simple to state, but not so easy to convey. That players were playing as Alex Vance, not the Gordon Freeman they've played in all prior Half-Life games, and that Alex is going to speak, unlike Gordon. These probably seem obvious to you now, but until we focused on them, it wasn't obvious to playtesters. Ensuring that everyone realized they were playing as Alex was something we decided to hit with the biggest hammer we could and name the product after her. But even with that, we were very careful in Eli's video call to ensure it's reinforced immediately. 
Olga, the character introduced here, was added to further drive it home by calling out when the player exits the elevator. Olga is the first character the player meets in person, and her dialogue here, and again ahead in the alley, is aimed at driving home the fact that she's conversing with the player, and that the disembodied female voice the player hears is Alex speaking back. This was harder to convey in Eli's video call, because it already features Russell speaking off-screen, whereas in this scene, there's clearly no one else around in the conversational space other than Olga and the player. Without Olga, we found that, even though they had already spoken to Eli and Russell over the video call, playtesters still didn't feel like they were Alex. Yeah, just gonna get rid of this tool tip real quick. Yep. When we started Half-Life Alex, we were very curious to find out how VR would impact our music design. The Half-Life series has always used music sparingly, often leaving the ambient sounds of the world to provide the audio background. But it is a tool we like to use to highlight moments where the world state has changed in some important way. In this case, that something's riled up the combine. In our early playtests of this scene, without music, but with many of the other visual and audio elements represented, we found some players didn't understand that they should move along, and that others became distracted by the interactive objects in the laundry. We experimented with some very simple quote-unquote action music to communicate the changing of the combine threat level, as well as the story's intention for Alex to get to safety, and found that players were less likely to forget their quest and move towards their goal. The music was kept simple and cinematic sounding to allow it to blend with the purposely complementary background sounds and gently start to normalize the use of music in VR in a familiar way. This success encouraged us to use the same technique in scenes with similar requirements later Alex, Alex. in the game. What is it? This doesn't seem like a routine sweep. Are you sure everything went okay? 100%. Keep your head down and be smart. The remainder of this level is designed to continue informing the player about the world they're in and to support the increase in the Combine's alertness. We also want a detail to make the city feel alive, something that becomes much harder later on, once the player has a weapon. This was tricky to design due to the challenge we're often faced with, the friction between narrative state and gameplay state. Here, the narrative implies that Alex should be making her way back to Eli as quickly and quietly as possible. But gameplay-wise, we're at the start of the game and players are still testing the limits of everything they can see and touch. Unsurprisingly, playtesting showed us that some players would dedicate themselves to following the narrative and quickly move through the area, while others would completely ignore the narrative and explore every nook and cranny. While it's tempting to simply remove all distractions in an attempt to unify all players towards following the narrative, it would send the wrong signal about the density of our world and how the game intends to reward players for exploring it. So we spent months refining this section, adding, changing, and removing elements. We tried to find the right level of narrative tension, where players felt like they should be moving along, but not so quickly that they can't stop to tinker with something. We put in enough interactive objects and narrative moments where players were always rewarded for looking around but we designed all those distractions to end quickly so we could encourage players to continue moving along. See, I never, I always played with continuous motion, so I never could actually see what was inside the apartment of the lady down there. So it's a really nice detail. So it's a really nice detail that you can actually make it up there and see into her apartment 
and then you see she's a cat lady. That's 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 detail. That's funny. All right, here we go, Kawabunga. No, 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 don't, 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 don't. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Always leaves an impact. <sighs> the is just so immersive, damn it. In order to limit the possibility of motion sickness that could be induced by moving the player in a vehicle, we initially wrote this scene to have Alex wake up after the van had already crashed. Players found this underwhelming, however, since the game seemed to be needlessly holding back an exciting moment that they could have experienced for themselves. Addressing this meant that we had to tackle the technical problem of moving the player comfortably in a vehicle. In this van, and in the train at the end of the map, you'll notice that the outside world is only visible through small windows. These outside views are necessary to provide motion parallax. The small window size ensures that the player's field of view is always dominated by the vehicle interior, which is naturally in the player's own frame of reference. This greatly reduces the occurrence of motion sickness. Aside from the parallax of the outside world, we use animated lighting and careful sound design to produce the effect of riding in a vehicle. That's what you get when you don't wear seatbelts. Yo. Alex, you there? Yep. You've got to get moving. Russell, I've been in an accident. I know. I caused it. So technically, not an accident. You've got to get moving. Wait, wait. Where's Dad? He's fine. Follow the drone. So, Dad's okay, right? Yeah, well, no. To be honest, he's in huge trouble. But... They've still got him. He was in a separate trip. And you saved me? Well, yes. I had no way of knowing who was in which van, so... Yes, the result was that I saved you. Where the last map was focused on conveying a lot of information about the world state to the player, this map is where we need to start the player's larger quest. That means the player must leave this map with an understanding of what's happened to Eli, and what they're going to do about it. The player also needs to meet Russell, so they have a face behind all the radio dialogue throughout the game. Finally, we need the player to collect the gravity gloves and the pistol and learn how to use them both. This is a daunting list. From experience we know that if we cram all that into a single scene, players won't be able to remember more than a couple highlights. So this map's purpose is essentially narrative pacing. We need to draw apart the required events, separating them with enough time and space that players could ingest and remember them. At the same time, we're a little under the gun. Playtesting showed us that by now, some players have been playing for 30 minutes, and they're wondering when they're going to see some enemies. One of the first steps the writing team took on this map was to flesh out a scene between Russell and Alex that covered all the dialogue we needed. Due to the fact the player is meeting Russell for the first time, and that there are a significant number of in-fiction events that Alex and Russell need to talk about, the scene ended up containing a lot of dialogue. We knew there was no way we could build a scene that long without boring the player, and the most important elements Russell, would be lost in the noise. What did you guys find? One of the first tools we used to address this was the introduction of Russell's drone. It allowed us to take chunks of the dialogue from that original scene and deliver them throughout the area preceding the scene. This meant the scene itself could skip over the in-fiction preliminaries and get right to the critical goal delivery. Russell, just hang on. I'm almost there.
What can I do in this playground? Can I s slide down? Does that count? In addition to delivering narrative at a consumable pace, this map needed to continue communicating the state of the world outside of the quarantine zone. We also wanted players to understand when Half-Life Alex takes place in the larger Half-Life timeline and to see for themselves the massive scale of the Citadel under construction. The power of the Combine is embodied in their indifference towards humanity. They've conquered Earth with little effort and are now plundering it for their own ends. They put a modicum of effort into their propaganda, but it's ultimately uncaring. Later in Half-Life 2, we see Breen's attempts to talk to humanity with more seriousness, but it's unclear whether that directive comes from the Combine or if it's just Breen's attempts to be useful to them. Meanwhile, the Combine construction is brutally efficient. The Citadel's pervasive feeder cables make no attempt to fit into the lives of the residents as the Combine drains the city of its power. Within this playground, a nostalgic nod to Half-Life 2, this enormous cable has been run right through the mural on the wall, demonstrating the Combine's total lack of interest in the history behind the city. There we go. All right, let's get going. Sure it is. Can't go down there. Alex, great. Okay, let's wait. My drone's okay, right? Nope, it exploded. I'm fine, by the way. Right, good, let's see. Just a minute. Russell, they've got Dad. I know. This, this is bad. Russell's You're laboratory is the first time the player is in the same room as another character, and it highlights one of the main challenges we face when designing choreographed scenes in VR, keeping the player and characters out of each other's space. In previous Half-Life games, we could always forcefully move the player if we really needed them out of the way. We made several attempts at finding a similar solution in VR, but found that it often made players feel deeply uncomfortable or disoriented. So instead, we designed these spaces to allow for a natural separation between the player and our characters. Where natural separators couldn't exist, we had to restrict players from moving into the character's space, removing that limitation as soon as the character had moved out of the way. Another challenge was balancing how often characters respond to player actions while delivering important narrative information. In early experiments, we allowed characters to stop mid-sentence, which allowed them to respond immediately to the player and then continue on with their dialogue. While technically straightforward, this was incredibly difficult to execute in animation and dialogue without feeling unnatural. The combination of custom reactions necessary to cover the range of possible player interaction and the resulting return to narrative dialogue quickly multiplied out of control. Eventually, we settled on a solution where we allowed only a minimum of interactions during the important narrative delivery sections, and a wider range of responses to more complex reactions after the scene has completed. In the case of Russell, we layer subtle head facing and natural eye contact on top of his performance while he is talking with Alex. Then, after the scene, when he is typing at the computer, he will respond to players trying to touch him or objects being thrown around. Oh, and get yourself a pair of Russells on the way out. Russells? The gloves, Alex. You know, the gravity gloves. 
I have a few sets through there. You can calibrate them out by the shed. Got it. We can do this, Alex. You got that, didn't you, that I said we could do it? Because we're gonna do it. Yeah, we are. I'm, I'm with you every, every step, step of the way. way. Right from our earliest experiments in VR, we learned that players expect a high level of audio fidelity, even from minute interactions, particularly when the sounds are meant to correspond to clearly observable visuals. For instance, in one of our prior games, it may have been acceptable to use a generic sequence of computer key sounds when Russell was typing. In VR, however, we know that a player can observe the animations very closely and even put their head right next to Russell's keyboard if they choose. In this case, players would notice a lack of one-to-one -one correspondence between the key press animation and sound. For Half-Life Alex, we authored a set of individual key press sounds to be driven by animation. For example, as Russell's fingers animate to press a key, one of these key press sounds is played, resulting in precise synchronization of the animation and sound. No, oh, muzzled off. Let's keep going. Oh, is there anything? I guess not. All right, you know how this goes. There should be a bunch of junk down One there. frustration Aim players may encounter in VR is having to physically bend down or reach out for objects in the virtual world, especially if they have limited real-world space. A common solution for this is to provide a way to bring objects to the player instead of forcing the player to go to them. We knew this would be an important feature in Half-Life Alex, with its sprawling levels and players' desire to explore every corner of the world. We didn't want this mechanic to feel too gamey or magical, so we decided to integrate it into the fiction of the game by making it a feature of the gravity gloves which are a natural precursor to the gravity gun of Half-Life 2. This allowed us to present the mechanic as a real physical action that's enabled by a piece of in-fiction technology. To emphasize the physicality that is unique to the medium of VR, we used a physical gesture to activate the pole instead of a button press, and then required the player to actually catch the object instead of automatically attaching it to the hand. This made the mechanic feel more natural and rooted in the fiction of the game's universe while allowing the player to feel powerful and accomplished. When a player pulls an object with the gravity gloves, we use the game's physics engine to apply a launch force to that object with a trajectory that is partially influenced by the direction of the player's pull gesture. We set the object's launch velocity to result in a standard flight time from pull to catch, so the player can develop a rhythm that eventually becomes automatic. We want the object to arrive at the hand as reliably as possible, so after the initial launch, we continually apply small impulse forces along the trajectory, represented by the white arrows. Those impulses help counter gravity and compensate for collisions with obstacles along the way, while continuously steering the object toward the hand, which is itself a moving target. A generous catch range and subtle haptic feedback when the object enters that range virtually guarantees that it will end up in the player's hand every time, even if their attention is focused elsewhere. One other benefit of implementing this with physics is that we didn't need to do custom handling for an object's size, mass, or inertia, and it automatically compensated for the non-standard gravity that players encounter inside the vault at the end of the game. I'm out. Give me some. Here you go. <sighs> Re toss it. Oh, you uh, took care of that lock then. Good. Great. Did have the key for it, but should have given you that. That's that's on me. Okay. All right, here we go. Next stop, Fairview Junction. Thanks, I Russell. guess. And good luck, Alex. Goodbye.
Obviously, just to let you know, I am still here, though. I know. So that's all for today. Let me know if you guys feel like seeing more of this by leaving a thumbs up and sharing your opinion in the comments down below. Bye for now, and as always, I will see you guys next time.